Okay, here we go. So Lori Sagawa Whaley is a third generation Japanese American baby boomer, baby boomer, and a descendant of the samurai warrior. Marriage, family, and life kept her occupied. In 1982, Lori and her husband journeyed to Japan and her life was forever changed. The heritage she once scorned became her newfound focus. She is passionate about her Japanese culture now. In 2005 and 2007, Lori was rear-ended, suffered traumatic brain injury, and was reading at a seventh grade reading level. Determined to overcome her circumstances, she set a goal to write a book for recovery. The new edition of that book, Let the Samurai Be Your Guide, was released March 2020 by Tuttle Publishing, right when COVID here, uh, reared its ugly head. Welcome to the stage, Lori. It's great to have you back. Well, welcome, everyone. My name is Lori Segal Whaley. I am also known as the Samurai Woman, and you will see from this presentation why I am call myself the Samurai Woman. When I was nine, Joe Willis tripped me, punched me in the gut, and said, you're a fat, ugly Jap. And after that, I wanted nothing to do with my heritage. I didn't even go to Japan until I was 28. And then in 19... 19- 82, my husband and I went to Japan and met the rich cousins on my father's side of the family. They gave me a copy of the Sagawa family tree and our family crest, which had three swords and three leaves that looked like three leaves that looked like hearts. And I said, Domo arigato gozaimasu. A few days later, we went to the Jidai Matsuri, the annual historical parade in Kyoto with over 2,000 people dressed in period attire. And there she is, Tomoe Gozen. I didn't even know there were female samurais. She was so strong, regal, and that image left a deep impression on me. Then a few days later, we packed away our goods and my heritage until but later in life, 2005 and 2007, I was rear-ended twice, the second time in 18 months. I was so messed up, I couldn't think straight, suffered chronic pain, Mild traumatic brain injury, but there was nothing mild about my condition. Reading at a seventh grade level. In fact, I endured over a thousand appointments in order to regain wellness. Then I started thinking about that female samurai warrior and her, that image that she had. And and I thought there's something about that. So I started researching. And then one day I found out that our family crest, I go to my husband, look, look, it's our family crest. There are three swords and the three hearts, well, three leaves that look like hearts. And it was one of the five main samurai crests of feudal Japan. I knew that that DNA of the samurai warrior, it's in me. And if that samurai spirit can move those warriors, it can move me. So I set a goal to write a book. And Every day, with what limited brain power I have, I would write, even if it was only 20 minutes a day. And I hired a book coach, Patrick Snow. I wrote the book, and it took a long time because I was recovering from traumatic brain injury. But as I as a book took shape, everything started to improve. My vision, I started seeing better, my mental clarity, and the chronic pain was starting to to dissipate. And I knew that if I finish that book, I will overcome traumatic brain injury. So the book was published in 2015. And then in 2018, I was offered a contract with Tuttle Publishing. And it came out right in March 2020, just as COVID hit. So we didn't get to go to Japan. (laughs) But the book is book is on Amazon. And now I'm able to get into other venues across the world. And this is the Code of Bushido Guide. It has all seven codes, which includes courage, integrity, benevolence, respect, honesty, honor, and loyalty. And if you would like a copy of this, I would be happy to send it to you. You can just put your email in the chat and I will be happy to give that, send that to you. And it's something worth framing because it's good. They say sage advice, but I would say this is good samurai advice. Never give up. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today, Gambaru. Because had I given up, I would be that person reading at a seventh grade level when I was, I am a college graduate. 
in chronic pain. And my husband would have to take care of me for the rest of his life. And I didn't want that for his retirement. So there's always a way. And I'd love to talk about Gambado because that's what my mother taught me. Never give up. Now, when you think about the samurai warrior, what do you think about? Is there anything that comes to mind? Is it that fierce warrior? Or is it Tom Cruise? You decide. The last summer I did bring the samurai more into the forefront, but it was slightly Hollywoodish. The samurai were the fierce warriors of ancient Japan. They ruled for over 700 years. And it was during the Tokugawa period from the 1600s to the 1800s, they came into problem. Um, more pronounced and they became more into power. And it was also during that time that they were a closed society. And it wasn't until Perry came and forced the doors open. But then also around that time, the Shogun said, no more samurai, no more sword. So that means that the samurai had no position in the United States. I mean, in, in Japan. So I believe a lot of them came to the United States because they didn't have a profession. So the samurai warrior, to me, were awesome warriors because they were both the left and the right brain. They were they practiced the martial arts. They were fierce warriors. But then also on the right side of the brain, they were the teachers, poets, artists, and philosophers. So here it is, Gambaru. Try your hardest, do your best, never give up, and go for broke. And that was also the motto of the Nisei soldiers during World War II. And I'd like to introduce you to a modern day samurai warrior, Chune Sugihara. He was born on January 1st, 1900, an auspicious day in, it, in itself, born to a middle-class samurai family. And he kind of favored his mother's side of the family. He loved languages and he loved art and wanted to travel the world. However, his father had a different plans for him. His father wanted him to be a doctor. However, he did not like the side of blood. So how could one become a doctor? He was obedient. He went to the, to the test in Korea for the medical school. However, he did nothing. He didn't, he didn't take the test. That means I was here, but I did not take the test. So that means he intentionally flunked the test. His father was furious. And at that time, his obligation to him ended. He had to fund his own career in college education. So he went to Waseda University and also answered an opportunity from the Japanese government. He became a diplomat from Japan to Lithuania right during the war. But prior to that time, he also was part of the Japanese army, but he out of protest, he quit, which was almost unheard of because he did not like the way that the Japanese were treating the Chinese people. So you see, he's a, he was a maverick. He didn't go with the norms, he followed his heart. And here you see the Polish Jewish refugees that came to his office. And there, as, as things were tightening, Germany was taking more control. They were, wanted to escape annihilation. So they came to his embassy and, and they were pleading for their lives because they knew that if they did not get the travel visas, they would be part of the statistics. Over 90% of them were annihilated. So Sugihara had a decision in front of him. Did he write the visas? But he would need permission of the Japanese government. So he wrote to them, well, wired to them at that point. And they said, no, do not write those visas. He thought one more time, I'll ask them, please, let me write those visas. The people are going to, they're going to perish if we don't write those visas. And again, the Japanese government said, 
no, do not write those visas. They kept coming by the swarms to his office or in front of the consul's office and said, please, one more time, I will write to them. And the answer was no. So three times he, he asked the government. So he had a decision. Do I, follow, do I follow what the government says or do I help people? And he made that decision with the help of his family because he told them, always would teach them, put yourself in their shoes. What would you do if you could not? If you were in their shoes, would you help? Would you help the per person on the other side? And what his young oldest son said, Papa, you have to help them. They need, they need, they need to have lives just like we did. So for about five weeks, he wrote visas tirelessly, sometimes 18 hours a day would write visas until his hands were swollen. His wife would massage them and do whatever she could because he didn't want her to be involved because she would have been implicated. This could have been their lives, their livelihood. It could have been imprisonment. So he wanted to protect her. And because of his courage over 2,000 visas were written, including one yeshiva, the Jewish religious school, in its entirety, over 300 students. And because of his bravery, he was awarded righteous among the nation, nations. And this is given by Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum in Israel. This was in 1984. 40 years past the time when he wrote the visas. But he, he unfortunately, he passed away the, the next year, but he died knowing that he did the right thing. So what would you do? Maybe there's something that the government says it's okay, but you know in your heart that it's wrong and moral. So I'd like to read to you from my book about Sugihara, because his life influenced me for many, many years. I first heard about him in 1993. And let's see, this is most important. Sugihara was a samurai warrior, yet he did not handle a gun or sword. He brought about change without going to battle. He was strategic yet peaceful decisive yet compassionate, and determined yet gentle. He was a peaceful warrior, and not every warrior has to be a battlefield hardened warrior, soldier to be a true warrior and hero. There are many attributes in Chuni Sugihara's life that you can emulate. Which one would you choose? And his, one of his quotes is, do the right thing and leave it alone. So he died knowing that he did the right thing. And because of Facebook, I have this wonderful image of the award that he, that he won because he only has one son right now that is alive. The rest of them have passed away. The next person I would love to share with you is about Helen Keller. Now we don't think about much, we think about Helen Keller. She's a very accomplished woman. But sometimes we forget about her struggles. She wasn't born blind and deaf. It came a few years later in her ch early childhood. But her parents spoiled her. And they wanted a tutor, and a, a tutor appeared. However, that tutor knew that if she continued that life that Helen was living, grabbing off of people's plates, having tantrums, she would have been incorrigible. So she worked with Helen and she was, although there were many battles, she helped Helen find her life. Some of her quotes are some of the most, I think most amazing quotes there are. She says the best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with a heart. That's Helen Keller. I am just as deaf as I am blind. The problem of deafness are deeper and more complex. 
if not more important than those of blindness. Deafness is a much worse misfortune, for it means the loss of the most vital stimulus, the sound of the voice that brings language, sets thoughts astir, and keeps us in the intellectual company of man. Helen Keller, 1880 to 1968. So for just maybe... 15 seconds, 30 seconds, I'd like you to shut off the noise, close your eyes, and imagine Helen Keller's world. I can't see you, but you can see me. And I just would like you to do that experiment just so that you can just get a glimpse of her world. So I'll just start right now. Imagine if that was your forever life. But she worked through that. She was the first blind person to graduate from college. And she wrote a book. Not only did she write a book and go to co finish college, she traveled the world and met dignitaries and opened the world for people that are deaf and blind. Alone, we can do so little, and together, we can do so much. That's Helen Keller. And so that's why we have We Empower You, the organization, the website, because we cannot do things alone, because I don't have the talents that other people possess, and they don't have some of the talents that I have. So together, we can make it better. We can make this world a better place. And isn't that what we all want for this planet? to leave the world a better place than when you, when you came into the world. Next person I'd like to share about is my mother, Mabel Sagawa. But on May 18th, 1980, you can just put in the chat, where were you? Some of you may not have been born by then. I know that Anthony wasn't, Larry wasn't. Or we could open it up. Can you just share what you were doing? and what you remember about the date? Does anybody want to share? Well, I know where I was. I, I won't forget that date. And I can remember seeing little some of that from afar. And the, when I, the place where I was was near Portland and the roads were being closed. There was so much damage done to the roads there, railroads, re regular highways were devastated. Trees came down. We didn't know if we were gonna make it back, but we did. And what was amazing is that was, there were very few lives lost, but they were given a bit of a, bit of a warning time to evacuate. So in spite of this tragedy or circumstances or natural disaster, something good can come out of it. And at that time, my parents uh, purchased a piece of property, dilapidated nursery, dilapidated equipment, buildings, and a defunct business. And my father said, well, what are we going to do with this? Because they, that's what they did. They were farmers as well as investing in real estate. My mom says, I'm going to run it. My dad says, you don't know anything about running a nursery, a business. She goes, I don't care. I, I'm going to do it. And that she did. She worked tirelessly. I've never seen her. My mother works hard, but when she worked out for the nursery, that was her, that was her baby. She raised six children. And this was her chance to prove that she could do something with her life. And so she put her heart and soul into it. She worked tirelessly. She would canvas the nursery. She would ask people questions. What, where's a good place? What should I do? What should I buy? And she went all throughout within with a hundred miles of where she lived. She'd come home at night 
tired, exhausted, but she was going to have that nursery. So the first week they opened, she thought, all I have to do is look pretty and come down to the nursery and I'll just be selling, selling like hotcakes. Well, one day during that first week, the only thing she sold was one lonely geranium. Just one, not two. Who buys one geranium, right? <laughs> so that was her sale for the week. And she felt like quitting. She felt like her honor was at stake and she wanted to quit. It's so easy to quit. It's harder to press through, as we all know, to reach and attain our goals. So she decided that because she taught us never to quit. There's always a way she would never let us quit. If we were sitting in front of the television, she'd go, oh, great. You can do some ironing. You can snap beans. You can clean out this drawer. There was never idle time because we lived on a farm. And I learned a lot, but I hated it. I didn't. I just said, this is not my life. I don't want, I don't want to live in the country. I don't want to get dirty because when we worked out on the farm, we would have to go out and pick berries and have the water roll down our sleeves and go to the bathroom in an outhouse. Oh, it was horrible. But it taught me how to work and I don't give up. That's one thing that I will say that my parents taught me. Never give up. There's always a way. But Never giving up is one thing, but you have to have your intention and your desire. Is your desire to finish? Is your desire to win? Is it your desire to make a difference in the world? If it's your de desire and intention, you put your stake in the ground and you don't quit. It doesn't matter because what would have happened if Thomas Edison would have quit before his successful invention or a successful try, what would have happened? Or what would happen to you if you were working on something and you just kept working and working and you felt like quitting, but you didn't? And that's what happened with me. I had that decision to make. I could have quit and say, well, that's my life. I'm going to re be reading at seventh grade level. My husband will be my chauffeur. And I won't get to, I won't be able to have, shall we say, quote, unquote, normal life. And I was, I didn't want that. I didn't want that for him. I didn't want that for me. And I don't want that for my grandchildren because I have five beautiful, adorable grandchildren and I wouldn't have gotten to enjoy them. So we all may come to our, a point in our life when that gambaru, that try your hardest, do your best, never give up and go for broke will come will be very, very um, what was important and beneficial to all of your lives because who, who wants quitters? The world is full of people. And you know, you even look around your house, sometimes you see little projects and things and that aren't finished and they're just kind of laying around. Well, we all have that, but the real important ones are the ones where you know we believe this is our calling. And my calling is to share about the Samurai Code of Ethics, taking that which I scorned and now I embraced, or making lemon lemonades out of lemon, lemonade out of lemon. 40 years later, the business is still thriving. It is a destination garden center in the Pacific Northwest, especially Southwest Washington. And people drive from Bellingham, to almost the, the Oregon border, Yakima, Spok I don't know about Spokane, but down along the coast, they, she has loyal customers that purchase her, her nursery stock because it's she really prides herself in having unusual, but also the best because they have their own greenhouses at my father's farm. And she just, she's such an inspiration to me. And this was taken, I think about four, 20 years ago. I couldn't be 40 years ago. And that's me right there laughing with my brother. <laughs> He's about six years younger than me and my mother. And then my father and my father passed away about last Thanksgiving. And to the day, almost to the day he died, he was working. He was fiddling and working with plants. So that never give up. And that's a Japanese philosophy too. They don't have 
a definition for retiring, especially in Okinawa. And I, I'd love to share with you about Ikigai, and that's what they do. So established in 81, and they, they're celebrating 40 years. And my brother now is my only surviving brother, and he's the one that's running the nursery. So like, remember Tomoe Gozen? Remember how she was this, she was a fierce warrior. In fact, they say that she could take on over 50 people at one time. And she didn't go alone. She didn't do battle by herself. And that's the same with you and me. We can't go, we don't go to battle by ourselves because we don't need to, right? We have people around us that can assist us. So for, it's like the yin and the yang. For every problem that a person has, there's somebody on the other side, if that's their goal, is to help them. For instance, we just heard from Debbie. People's goal may be having better health. They've reached a point in their life where they need to take care of their health are people like Tiu that can help you find your life, that there is life after unfortunate circumstances. And just like with me, I, I love to teach people about the samurai ethics because they are, there can be, they are like an anchor in a sea of turmoil and that guide through the maze of life. Thank you so much, Lori. It's been great to have you here today. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it.